it going? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Awesome. So thanks for coming down here. I appreciate this. I had uh, two presentations this morning with the middle school, sixth graders first, then the seventh and eighth graders uh, second, and uh, I get to talk to you. I think this is being streamed to the rest of the school, so I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm so grateful to your superintendent, to your administrators, to your teachers for allowing me to come here. My name is Michael DeLeon. I, uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm not home very much. In fact, I haven't been home since January 2nd, <laughs> and I'm not going to be home again until July 3rd. I was home 12 days last year. I was in my house 12 days for the whole year. Uh, every year at Christmas, I have six days off. I get one week off a year, um, Christmas week. But I'm in a prison every day in Tennessee. So I go into six different, five different state prisons, one federal prison in Tennessee through Christmas week. So I'm home, but I'm not really home all day. I'm home at night. I go into prisons, about 120 prisons a year, uh, to talk to men and women who are incarcerated. I have a program that I developed that I take into prisons. But my focus, uh, my mission is middle school and high school students. So I spend every single day, right up till the end of June, I start in the beginning of August. Uh, New York, you don't know, in some states, they, they go back to school in August, and then they're out in May. So from the beginning of August until the end of June. And then in July, I'm in prisons all summer. I'm in uh, juvenile detention centers all summer. And I didn't come to waste your time. I didn't come to beat you in the head. I didn't come to get you out of the classroom, okay? This learning time in the classroom is vital. I came because I have some truth to share with you, and it's truth you're not getting. Now, never before in the history of our country has an entire generation of people been so systemically lied to. Like, you're being lied to, you know? I mean, watch Fox News for an hour and watch MSNBC for an hour and try to figure out where the truth is, right? You're being lied to. You know, people say, Google it, Google it. Huh. Anything at the top of Google is what's paid to be at the top of Google. You understand? So you're being lied to. And we're in the middle of a crisis, and that crisis is for real. So I came to talk to you about it. Now, I know and I understand that not everyone is going to listen. Not everyone's going to listen, right? The people in the classroom, people in this room, some of the middle school kids I got to talk to, some of you won't listen. I have truth to share with you, but it won't become your truth. Either one, you don't listen, or two, you suffer from confirmation bias. That's something that you should understand. Confirmation bias is an illness, it's a sickness, where people believe what they believe, and nobody can change their mind about it, right? They just believe what they believe. So someone presents some evidence that you might not know the truth, but you are so, you're gripping onto that reality, that false reality, that you know everything, and you're not going to listen to anyone who's got contrary information. I was in Wallace, Idaho, right? I want to talk to you about today vaping, marijuana legalization, drugs. We're in a crisis. Fortunately, America is not paying attention. Uh, I was in Wallace, Idaho about six months ago, right? And um, I had a 6th through 12th grade school. I had all the high school kids come down to the auditorium first. And as they were leaving out, the middle school kids were coming in. I had to go to the bathroom. So I said to the principal, I'll be right back. I have to go to the bathroom. And I walked up to the bathroom. An eighth grader had peeled off from his class to go into the bathroom to hit his vape. <laughs> He's on his way to the vaping assembly, but he goes into the bathroom to hit his vape on the way. So when I walk in the bathroom, he's looking at me like, who is this guy? You know, I wear my hat backwards and Jordans, and I just try not to look like an adult, right? He's like, who is this guy? So he turns, and he's hiding his vape in his pocket so I don't see it, except I already saw it. And I was like, yo, kid, you vaping? He's like, yeah, mango. I said, mango? Bro, did you just say mango? Yeah. Where do you get your flavored pods? My older brother gets it for me. How old is he? Puffs out his chest. He's like, he's 17. Why? I said, kid, how old are you? He goes, I'm 12. He flexed on me. I'm 12. I was like, okay, Schwarzenegger, have a nice day. You know what I'm saying? 
I go back to do my assembly. And I'm talking to my wife about it that night on the phone. I told her what happened. She's like, you're kidding. He was vaping. He walked in the door. Yeah, babe. When I walked in the door, he had his vape in his mouth. Well, did you take his vape? Did I take his vape? I'm not his father. I'm not a school official. I'm not going to take something from a kid I don't know. Well, did you go to the principal and get him in trouble? No, babe. I went back to do my assembly, I told you. She's like, I don't get it. Yeah, I know. I'll explain it to you when I get home, all right? I'm married to the coolest chick in the world, man. My wife is as chill as ice, but sometimes she don't get it. You're high school students, though. I know you get it. So yes or no, if I took that kid's vape, would he have got another one? If I got him in trouble with the principal, that would have stopped him from vaping? See, told you, you get it. So the kid walks right down the aisle of the auditorium at the end, and he comes, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure, kid, come here, what's up, what's up? What's up? Well, everything you showed us, everything you told us today, look, I didn't know. I really didn't know. I mean, I thought vaping was no big deal. He goes, here, you take it. And he handed it to me. It was a lava two. He had a mango pot in it. And he gave it to me. Every single day, in almost every single school I go to, kids come up to me at the end, and they put their vapes in my hands. I got five little vapes from your little kids. Yeah. I got this little Mr. Fogg from one of your sixth graders. One sixth grader, and these four came from seventh and eighth graders. I um, mean, I got a vape from a third grader a couple weeks ago. A third grader. Last year, our office, my wife runs our office. My wife started getting phone calls from elementary schools. Yes, we got this in the mail. You know, we have middle schools. We'd like your husband to come talk to our middle school and high school students. But does he do elementary schools? My wife started saying last year, you want him to come talk about vaping to elementary school kids? Yes, third, fourth, and fifth graders. But anyway, this third grader comes up to me. He had a Mr. Fogg, a green apple Mr. Fogg, and he gives it to me. I was like, where'd you get this? My older brother. What class is he in? Let's go see him right now. No, he's in the middle school. I'm going to the middle school this afternoon. What's his name? I don't want to tell you his name. Snitches get stitches. I was like, what, what grade are you in, kid? He's like, third. Snitches get what? Stitches. What are stitches? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know what stitches are, but snitches get them, huh? Yeah. Stop watching reruns of The Sopranos, okay? Third grader with a Mr. Fogg from his middle school brother, right? Listen, I ain't talking about this school, okay? Could be this school. Could be this school, could be your middle school, or any school you know. How many of y'all know a high school kid who drinks alcohol? How many of y'all know a high school kid who drinks alcohol? Oh, okay, man, we're not snitching by raising our hand. I'm not asking for names. There's no cameras looking at who's going to raise their hand. How many of y'all know a high school kid who drinks alcohol? Okay. How many of y'all know a high school kid who smokes weed? Notice how the hands went up. How many of y'all know a high school kid who vapes? And how many of y'all know a middle school kid who vapes? Look at that. Raise your hand if you know an elementary school kid who vapes. Look, look. So, I don't know. I don't know if you like being lied to, but you're being lied to. I don't know if you like being used but you're being used. The tobacco industry has figured out a way to save their industry, and they have saved their industry by lying to you. And I'm sorry to say this. I really hate to say this. I ain't a Republican, and I ain't a Democrat. Okay? They both feed from the same trough. I ain't into politics in any way, shape, or form. You know, I'm not into politics at all. And I love this country. But your federal government, they have failed you absolutely failed you. Your state government, they failed you too. Marijuana legalization is absolutely destroying your uh, generation because it ain't weed. It's not marijuana. The garbage that they're selling at your gas stations and 
shops all over New York, has toxins in it, and it is absolutely crazy what's taking place. And I'm begging you to listen to me because I don't want to waste your time. I know some of you won't listen. There was uh, four girls in Mississippi left my presentation like two weeks ago. Four girls. They walk right out and they walk right to the bathroom. And one girl's got a vape on her because she's the thug. You know, she's the gangster. She's carrying the vape in her bra. So she pulls her vape out and she hands it to the other kid after she hits it. And then you put it in your mouth and you put it in your mouth and you put it in your mouth. You know, everybody's sharing the vape. Okay. And then, like, she doesn't want to carry it on her for the rest of the day. So she puts it in the neck napkin thing in the female girl's bathroom for hiding. And so you guys don't understand what you're putting in your body. There was this kid in Mi Michigan, big kid, high school senior, right? Got a football scholarship to college. And so he leaves out of my assembly and he goes into the bathroom right from my assembly. The school's got these anti-vaping posters up all over the building, you know, because an anti-vaping poster is going to get you to stop vaping, right? I love getting to the schools and it says, this campus is tobacco-free. Oh, good. Why am I here? Don't even know why I'm here. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, he goes into the bathroom and he stands in front of the anti-vaping poster and he vapes in my honor. Just left the vaping assembly, vaping in Mike's honor. And then he posts it on Snapchat. So another girl in school saw, she felt it was disrespectful, so she shares it with the principal. And I don't know how Snapchat works, trust me, I ain't never been on Snapchat. But anyway, he screenshots it, or she screenshots it, but he's got a picture now on his phone of the kid vaping in the bathroom in front of the anti-vaping poster, so mom gets a phone call. He's getting suspended for five days. But before he gets suspended, he wants the kid to apologize to me. Sir, that's not necessary. Oh no, he's apologizing to you. Okay, whatever. So he comes into the counselor's office where I was sitting, and, uh, hey, kid, before you say one word, um, if you're going to apologize to me because they're making you apologize to me, hold your breath. What? Principal's getting upset with me because he wants the kid to apologize, but I don't want a fake apology. A fake ap How many of y'all ever got a fake apology from someone yet, right? How many of you ever had your little brother and little sister be forced by your parents to apologize to you for breaking something? Mom says I'm sorry. Oh, she does, does she? <laughs> okay. I don't want a fake apology. So I said to the principal, can I have a couple minutes with this kid? And he's like, sure. So I sit down at the table with this kid, and it took me one minute. It took me one minute, y'all. Dude starts tearing up. He starts crying. He's like, man, I'm hooked, man. You don't understand. I've thrown vapes away 10 times. I keep going and getting another one. I can't quit. When you said we could give you our vapes, I'd give you my vape right now. But I know. I'll just go get another one. I said, I thought they took your vape. He's like, no, I got another one in my pocket. <laughs> he had a backup in his pocket. I said, kid, I get it. Here, here's my card. On my website, I have a way to quit. It's 10 steps. It works. It ain't easy. I mean, there ain't no magic pill to take. But if you want to quit, you can quit. If you want to quit, it's not going to be easy. But if you don't quit now, y'all, if you don't quit now, you're in for a rude awakening. About three and a half months ago, I testified before the FDA, and I made a statement. And the statement I made was, uh, one third of Generation Z will die by 45 years of age from three illnesses. Number one, respiratory disease. Number two, heavy metal poisoning. And number three, cancer. By 45 years of age. And the gentleman from the FDA panel called me crazy. He said, you're nuts. Do you know how many kids that is? I said, I know exactly how many kids that is. This is my eighth year of massive research on this. I work with 100 pediatricians in 50 states, two pediatricians in 50 states. I've tested 7,000 vapes. Those vapes I got from them, middle school kids, I'll crack them all. I swab them. I stick it in a plastic test tube. When I reach 100, they're carrying it in my suitcase. When I reach 100, I send it to a lab in Elmwood Park, New Jersey. And I get a list of chemicals, every hundred vapes. I'm going to show you the chemicals. I said, I understand what that means, how many kids will die. Anyway, he said, you're nuts. And they went on to the next witness. I stayed, the panel, I stayed. I wanted to listen to all the testimony. The next guy who testified, he was a pulmonary specialist at Emory University in Atlanta, one of the biggest medical colleges and medical hospitals in our country. Right, research hospital, and he's a pulmonary specialist, which means he handles the lungs. 40 years as a pulmonologist. 
And he says, before I start my testimony, I'd like to address Mr. Robinson, is it? Yes, sir. Uh, you called this witness crazy. You said he was nuts. And you said he's exaggerating. As a 40-year pulmonologist, I'm here to tell you he's underestimating the problem. For me to testify in front of the FDA, what do I know? But for a guy with 40 years of experience, one good thing that's going to come out of COVID is that we're going to have enough ventilators for your generation. And you don't see it right now because you got these little Mr. Fogs, these raspberry ices and these strawberry banana breezes and these peach grape hides, and you're hitting them, and you think it's no big deal. I get it. You're being lied to. Worst year we ever had in American history was last year. We lost 107,735 people to an overdose. 70% of that was fentanyl poisoning. New York, you're number two. Ohio is the worst state in America for fentanyl death. New York is number two. This is getting out of control. And this year, huh, it's going to dwarf that number by 10,000. One week after that announcement came out, they clarified it's fentanyl poisoning. The number one cause of death in America, 18 to 45 years of age, is fentanyl poisoning. And the fastest growing demographic from people dying from fentanyl poisoning is 14 years of age and younger. We're losing babies. In fact, 27 years of age and below, the number one cause of death in America is drugs and alcohol. And you're sitting here at this school, your future's ahead of you, some of you go to college, some of you be real smart and go to community college or vocational trade school, because you're really smart. Or maybe you'll join the military. Or maybe there's never been a better time to be a high school senior graduate in high school because, man, you could go, you could go make $30,000, $40,000 at, at Panera Bread. I mean, you can enter the workforce right now at a rate that's never been available to your parents and the people before you. But you're sitting here in high school and your whole future is ahead of you. Whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, your entire future is ahead of you. And some of you are making choices and decisions that are going to affect the rest of your life. The rest of your life. You know, um, last March, a year ago, Elon Musk was being interviewed in the UK. And he was talking about birth rates and infertility in the world. And he started to talk about in the countries that have legalized marijuana, and not just legalized marijuana, but embraced it, in the countries that have the highest um, vaping rates, the UK, the United States of America, Canada, their birth rates are declining the most. You know that, why that is? See, because if you're a young man or a young lady and you meet the person of your dreams, you know, when you start dating in your 20s, because you don't date until you're in your 20s, but when you start dating and you meet that person of your dreams and you guys get married, and now your in-laws and your parents are like, okay, you're married now, where's the babies, grandbabies, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. So you start to, like, you know, think about having a family. It ain't working out. So you go off to the doctor, and he's going to send you for a little test, young man. And then he's going to be sitting in that office. You're going to be sitting next to Boo, holding her hand. And doctor's going to open up your medical file. And he's going to say, uh, young man, when you were in uh, high school, in your early 20s, were you vaping? Were you vaping high-potent THC, marijuana? And girl's going to look over at you waiting for the answer if she don't know it. And yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, you and the missus here, you might think about adoption. Females, too. Them follicles, you need them. You need some things to have children, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not talking to middle school kids. I'm talking to mature high school people. Here's the thing you're being lied to. And I don't do this because I know a lot about it. I'm a filmmaker. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I know a lot about it. I've been obsessively researching this uh, for the last 17 years, vaping for the last eight years. I don't do this because I went to college for it. I have six college degrees. Six. Big deal. That means nothing. It means I have a lot of student loans. That's all it means. I do this because I lived it. I lived it. That's the prison cell right there. That's where I spent the last five of my 12 years in prison. I spent 12 years in prison. There was six prisons, 22 cells for 12 years. When I went to prison, I was asked to run a program at Rahway State Prison where I spent the last five called Scared Straight. I don't know if anybody ever heard of it. Scared Straight? Anybody ever heard of Scared Straight? Anybody ever watch a television show, Beyond Scared Straight, a &E TV? So I did that show for five seasons. It was on television for nine seasons. I consulted on 
first five. And if you never saw the show, let me just quickly explain it to you. This poster right here, it is for season two. And that little kid in the poster, his name is Johnny. Johnny's a little 12-year-old gangster, you know what I'm saying? He's a, little, he's a little middle school thug, and he's getting in a lot of trouble. He's disrespecting his teachers, his principal, not listening to his parents, skipping school, breaking into people's houses, and he's getting high. So his father's like, listen, Johnny, if you stay on this path, you're going to end up in jail one day. Johnny's like, yeah, whatever, I'm 12, okay? You don't think it's going to happen to you, huh? So every Wednesday and every Saturday, groups of kids would come into Rahway State Prison, and there's a group of men like me. We're supposed to scare little Johnny to death. We're supposed to be screaming in his face and spitting in his face, I'm going to kill you if you come in here, Johnny. You're going to die. So Johnny's all scared. He wets his pants. Ah! At the end of the TV show, right, there's this narrator, and he's giving you the update on all the kids who visited the prison. Little Johnny's doing his homework and listening to his mommy. Yeah, okay. So raise your hand if you think scared straight works. Huh. Raise your hand if you don't think scared straight works at all. Right? Of course. 80%, ladies and gentlemen, 80% of the kids who came into scared straight, they got incarcerated as an adult. 80%. Uh, I had a counselor ask me at a conference recently, 80% of the kids that came into that program, they were incarcerated as an adult? I said, yes, ma'am. So basically it worked for 20% of the kids. Nah, they didn't count the dead kids. She said, what? 15% of every kid who came into that program died before their 18th birthday. 15% shot, stabbed, overdose, poisoning before they turned 18, okay? And 80% of them got locked up as an adult. So does it work? Nah, it doesn't work. It works 5% of the time. But why would I wanna do something that works 5% of the time? So I wanted to do something different. I don't know a single person in this room. I don't know a single middle school kid. I don't know anybody that lives in Schenectady, okay? I don't know anybody that goes to this school district. I've dedicated my life to you. I've dedicated my life to you. I, when I said I left home January 2nd, I won't be home again on July 3rd, it is so hard, you have no idea. Not because of planes and rental cars in a different hotel every night. I miss my wife. I miss my wife. I've been married to the same girl for 30 and a half years. That girl, she never missed a visit. Every Sunday, she'd be at the prison for an hour visiting me. My wife didn't have a husband for 12 years. I didn't get to see my daughter from age 7 to age 19. She was too petrified to come to prison. My son didn't come to visit me in prison either. He was two years older than my daughter. I asked him on the phone one day, hey, Corey, why don't you come want to come visit me? Because I'm ashamed of you, Dad. I said, I'm ashamed of me too. <laughs> I guess I'll see you when I get home. He's like, when's that going to be? I have no idea. I'll see you when I get home, I guess. So I didn't see my son for 12 years. I didn't see my kids, and I only saw my wife every Sunday for an hour. You know, and if the prison was locked down for some fight or something, uh, visits were canceled. It's a life you don't want for yourself. But it's also a life that none of you think is going to be your life. None of you think that's going to happen to you. Nobody in this room thinks that's going to happen to them. Huh, here's the thing. Statistics say one-third of you in this room, one-third of high school students, one-third of your generation is going to struggle with addiction. Because you raise your hand that you know a high school kid smoking weed and drinking. You raise your hand that you know a high school, middle school kid vaping. You don't think synthetic nicotine, Nick Salts. You don't think THC, Delta 8, Delta 10, all this stuff that they're selling at your freaking gas stations and your vape shops. You think THCO and THCP and THCV and HHC. Listen, I'm an expert. I study it all. And I died six times. I was brought back by a drug called naloxone. They call it Narcan now and put it on cops' belts. Put it in nurses' office at schools. You could do an auto-injector. You can spray it up their nose. When I died, it was a full needle, okay, and I died in the hospital. I was on a ventilator for nine days. I was on a life support machine for nine days. I came back from all of it. Why? Well, when I got out of prison, I realized what I needed to do with my life. Now, you don't have to listen to me. You don't. I mean, I don't. Some of you ain't listening. It breaks my heart. It really does. Some of you are going to listen. That. But I, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna listen one day, you know? I was at a big treatment center the other day. It's 160 people, right? 
and I said, 160 men and women. It was a co-ed treatment center. And uh, I said, raise your hand if this is your first time in treatment for addiction. Not one. Not one. Raise your hand if this is your second time in treatment for addiction. Not one. Raise your hand if this is your third time in treatment for addiction. And there was one girl. And everybody else was in treatment four, five, six, seven, eight times. One guy's like, I've been in treatment 22 times. Okay. When are you going to wake up? When are you going to get it? I overdosed five times. I overdosed four times. I overdosed six times. Okay. You're playing Russian roulette with your life. But I'm... I understand I can't, I can't save these people. I, I can't fight addiction. I can't fight addiction. All I can do is prevent it from starting in the first place. See, that's why I come to talk to middle school and high school students, because I don't want what happened to me to happen to you. But again, none of you think it's going to happen to you. So that's me on a horse at three years of age. I know it's a pony. Let me live my fantasy. Um, I was three years of age on a pony in Ireland, right? I was born in Ireland. I wasn't born in America. My family immigrated to this country when I was five. And I was so scared on that horse, I peed my pants. I fell off the horse once already. There's a skin on my knee. I didn't want to get back on the horse. I was petrified. We were the poorest family in Ireland, okay? See them pants? They ain't pants. They're curtains. My mom found curtains in garbage. We didn't have a house in Ireland. We were gypsies, okay? Homeless in a carriage. And um, we got to America... And we were the poorest family in this country. That's the first picture my father took of me when we got to America, right? On the left. That's, a, that's my fifth grade school picture right there with that bowl haircut that my mother gave me that morning for our school pictures. Anybody ever heard of a bowl haircut? Those are the ones that I got. My mom didn't cut her hair because she liked cutting hair. My mother hated cutting hair. Look at that haircut. <laughs> she cut her hair because we couldn't afford the barber. In 1975, yo, haircuts were a dollar. Kids' haircuts were probably 50 cents a quarter. My mom didn't have a quarter, so I never went to the barber. She cut her hair in the dining room, you know what I mean? And I never missed a day of school. I had perfect attendance from first through fifth grade. Not because I loved school, which I did. I did love school. But the reason why I never missed a day of school, see, that's where I got breakfast and lunch. I'm sure none of you Schenectady kids can understand this. See, if I didn't make it to school, yo, I didn't eat breakfast and lunch. My parents put one meal on the table. It was called dinner, okay? Not because they were mean, because that's all we could afford. We were dirt poor. Man, I never went back to school shopping. All the kids getting new kicks and new gear for school. Never. I never put uh, a new pair of shoes on until I was out of high school. I never pulled a tag off an article of clothing until after high school. I wore whatever was handed down from neighbors. We were dirt poor, and I didn't care. I was the happiest little kid in the world. My mom said to me, how come you didn't close your lips for your school picture? Your chipped tooth is showing. I don't care about that chipped tooth, man. I was the happiest little dude in the world. My tooth was chipped because my Uncle Seamus hit me in the mouth with a brick on purpose. It got kind of rough. And fifth grade is where my whole life changed. And sixth grade is where it went straight downhill. Fifth grade, my whole life changed. My father was always on the road. He would fix planes. My father was an airplane mechanic, and you'd have thought we'd have made more money, but he didn't. He was gone before we got up for school in the morning. He wouldn't get home until we were already in bed at night, so I didn't see my old man a lot Monday through Friday, so I had these two uncles, and they were going to step it up. We're going to make a man out of you, and that meant their fists on my face. They used to snatch me up in the yard and tie me up while I was doing yard work. They wrapped me with duct tape. My Uncle Michael would drag me by my hair to the garage. They threw a rope over the rafters in the garage and tied it around my neck. And they pulled me up onto a chair. I'd be duct tape hung to the ceiling. And they cut the tape off my arm so I could pull myself up. And if I didn't do it fast enough for them, they would kick the chair out from underneath my feet. My Uncle Michael would dangle me there until I passed out. And they'd lay me on the ground floor. And I'd wake up 8, 9 o'clock at night walking into my house. And my mom would be like, where have you been? Playing, Ma. I was playing. Go to your room. Playing. I was playing, all right. They were playing with my life, but uh, they were going to make a man out of me. And um, I got off the bus May of fifth grade, like a month and a half left in the school year, and my father's in the driveway packing up his car, which was a rare occurrence because he was always gone before we get up for school in the morning. But today, he's packing up his car, so I'm going to find out where he's going. So I ran across the lawn, up the driveway, and I was like, Daddy, Daddy, where are you going this time? Go ask your mother. Okay, but when are you going to be home, Dad? He says, go ask your mom. So I ran in the house, asked my mom where my dad was going, and my mom told me dad was going to divorce. And I was like, where's that, ma? 
is it far? So I ran to the globe in the living room, the map of the world. I used to look up all the places where my father was because my mom would be like, your daddy's in Arizona, your daddy's in Massachusetts. And I would find all these places on the map, but I couldn't find divorce. Like I looked, I spun the globe like 20 times. I can't find it. Mom, I can't find divorce on the map. Where is it? And she's like, son, have a seat for a second. See, you're going to be going to daddy's house every other weekend. (laughs) This is daddy's house and mommy's house. I don't understand. Mom, where's divorce? See, the word wasn't in my vocabulary. I didn't know what divorce was. I thought it was a city or a state my dad was going to go work at. And I didn't know one single kid in school whose parents were divorced. Not a one. How many of y'all in this room know a kid whose parents are divorced? Welcome to America. (laughs) How many of y'all know a kid whose parents are divorced? And let's be honest, that kid's definitely affected because of the breakup of their family. Anybody know someone? Yeah. Hey, here's one. How many of y'all know... How many of y'all know a kid whose parents used to love each other like every day was Valentine's Day, and now they hate each other, and the kid's caught in the middle? How many of y'all know a kid whose one parent uses the kid against the other parent? That was me. That was me. And I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. So I'm failing school. I start the sixth grade first marking period. And I no longer have perfect attendance from the first week because I'm putting my hands on every kid in school. See, I became the biggest bully in school. How many of y'all ever heard that expression, hurt people hurt other people? Anybody heard that? I hurt like hell, so now I'm going to take it out on you. So I'm beating up everybody in school. I'm treating girls disrespectfully, calling them names. I had a horrible, horrible experience. I didn't know what to do. And Mrs. Kogan, my counselor, she knew what to do. So she came to my class. She pulled me out in the hallway, and she said, Michael, how's it going at home? I'm good. She's like, no, you're not. Talk to me. I'm your counselor. I'm here to help you. I'm good. She's like, Michael, please, you're failing school. You're getting suspended every single week. I'm here to help you. Talk to me. I'm good. (laughs) But I wasn't good. I wasn't good. I needed to talk to her, but I didn't want to talk to her. Not because I didn't like her. I love that lady. Every kid in school loved that lady. I didn't want to talk to her because talking about it hurt, and I hurt, so I don't want to hurt more. So they tried to get my coach to talk to me. He comes up to me after wrestling practice one day. How's it going, son? He's like, I'm okay, coach. Good, son. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, young man. That's what I'm always telling you kids. I was like, be in my office if you need me. Okay, coach. Thanks for the advice. They tried to get the woman in the cafeteria to help me. We used to call her the cafeteria mom. I don't know if they call heads of cafeteria cafeteria mom anymore, but Mrs. Campbell, heavyset African-American woman. God, I straight up love that lady. That woman was like a mom to every kid in school. And she called us all child. I think that's because she couldn't remember our names. But anyway, she called every kid child. How's it going, child? I'm okay, Miss Campbell. She's like, okay, baby. We're here if you need us, okay? We're here if you need us. And I was like, if I need you, I'll let you know. I never let her know, though. I never asked her for help. So one day my mom comes to pick me up suspended from school again. The principal says, Mrs. DeLeon, what's going on with you and your husband is affecting your child, his grades and his behavior, and he refuses to talk to anyone in school. You're going to have to get somebody to talk to your son. So my mom's like, well, I'll take him to get some counseling. principal's like, that's a good idea. So my mom takes me to a trusted adult to get some counseling. The trusted adult sexually molests me, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And if you think I wanted to talk about that, hell no. I don't want to talk about that. There was eight of us. There was seven other kids in my school that were molested by that monster. And you know what they did with them? They moved them to Erie, Pennsylvania, so he wouldn't hurt us anymore. You know what he did? He molested 54 more kids over the next 20 years. And he never paid the price. He was never even arrested. And I carried that hatred around me my whole life. I carried that hatred around with me my whole life. And I buried it deep down inside my soul. Let me tell you about hatred. Because I'm so sick and tired of America divided Oh, you're different than me because you're darker. You're different than me because you have a different religion. You're different than me because you love someone else. I'm so sick of the hatred in this country. But I'll tell you about hatred that nobody will admit. Nobody will admit this about hatred. Hatred turns into self-hatred 100% of the time. 
If you hate anybody outside of you for whatever reason, and you don't get it in check, and you don't understand that skin color is skin deep, if you don't understand that cultural we should be celebrating instead of dividing, if you don't believe this media and these government leaders are trying to divide us, if you don't believe that, and you hate anything outside of yourself, it turns into self-hatred, and you implode. I'm the living example of it. And now I've worked on 300 films, and about 130 of them are about that, and I see it everywhere I go. I go into prisons. I go into um, institutions, and I see it everywhere I go. I get the film all over this country, wherever I am. If there's a riot, then they want to find out where I am, if I could go film. And I interview people, and I see it. I see what hatred's doing to this country. And the only way we're going to stop it is you. See, I never talked about it, and my uncle's beatings get worse. It turns into child abuse. I went to the state championship as a wrestler, freshman, junior, and senior year. The only year I didn't wrestle was my sophomore year. My uncle Seamus punched me in the face so hard he cracked my right orbital. He broke my right eye socket. I couldn't wrestle my sophomore year. And if, I didn't, if my coach didn't lie about my medical records, I'd have never wrestled again. I had 33 college scouts come to my high school senior year, come to the state championship in Atlantic City. I had 33 scouts come scout me, except they had access to my real medical records. <laughs> Nobody wanted to touch me with a 10-foot pole. So my whole life changed. This is my sixth grade school picture on the left. That's where the abuse started. I tried to smile through it, though. That's my high school freshman yearbook picture. That's where the abuse stopped. The sexual abuse, the physical abuse never stopped until I got out of high school. You know, and I got kind of big in high school, especially junior and senior year, but I had two uncles to contend with, so they ganged up on me, and that was going to toughen me up. And it didn't toughen me up. It didn't toughen me up. And one day I was suspended from school. It was sixth grade. I was down at the basketball courts in our neighborhood watching a bunch of men play basketball in the middle of the day. And there's this kid named Jimmy in our neighborhood. He's 17. This kid's the coolest kid in the whole neighborhood, man. The cops are always at his house. That's how cool he is. So he's playing basketball with these older guys, right? And I'm just kind of watching him play. And he comes over after the game. He grabs his towel off the wall I was sitting on. And he wipes all the sweat off his chest and face and head. He could have wrung this towel out. It was so disgusting. Except he throws it in my face. And it wraps all around my head. And all I could do was throw it on the ground and start crying. His sweat was dripping off my nose and my chin. It was so gross. And I started crying. He said, I'm sorry, little man. I was just kidding. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing. Leave me alone. I'm sorry. Give me that towel. I, I apologize. I was just kidding with you. Talk to me. Talk to me. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. But I did want to talk about it like I really did want to talk about it. I just didn't want to talk about it with all the trusted adults in my life. And I don't know if you could appreciate this. After what happened to me, I didn't trust adults anymore. But here's the coolest kid in the whole world, and he's asking me what's up. He's asking me what's the matter. He won't stop asking me. He must care about me. Like, he must be my friend. <laughs> so I told him. I told him everything. I never told anyone anything. I told that kid everything. And he listened to me. And he opens up his backpack. He pulls a pack of cigarettes out of it. He throws a cigarette in his mouth. He lights it. He takes a big drag. He blows it on out. And I was just watching him. And he takes a cigarette out of his mouth. He's like, here, little man. This will help calm your nerves. Calm my nerves? Okay. Hey, what are nerves? <laughs> I don't even know what nerves are, but it's going to calm them. So I smoked this cigarette. I didn't cough. The hair on my arm stood up when I smoked that cigarette. I had a rush in my brain when I smoked that cigarette. You know what's crazy? For like three minutes, I didn't think about my miserable life while I smoked a cigarette with the coolest kid in the whole world. Then I smoked a second one with him. Then I smoked a third one with him. On the way out of the basketball courts, I was walking home. Hey, little man, we're having a party Friday. You should come. Party. He wasn't talking about ice cream cake and streamers. He's talking about an adult house party. I don't got any business going to some adult house party, but I went anyway. And I'm sitting on this sofa in the middle of this living room, right? And this guy named Garrett comes over. He's 25. He sits down next to me. He puts his arm around me. Jimmy told me what was going on with you, little dude. I'm so sorry. Here, I hope this helps you brand new pack of cigarettes in his hand. I didn't even know how to get the cellophane open to open it. He opened it for me. He lit a cigarette. He handed me the lit cigarette. He gave me his lighter, you know, because he's kind like that. And he gave me back that brand new pack of cigarettes with 19 cigarettes left. And I'm sitting on a sofa at a house party smoking a cigarette like I'm the coolest 11-year-old kid in the whole world. 
And the guy across the living room, he's pouring beer off the keg for everybody at this party, and he's kind of been checking me out. So he fills a big solo cup up with alcohol, and he walks on over. Hey, little guy, it's time to become a man. I don't think 11's time to become a man. Alcohol don't make you into a man, but I drink that cup of beer down like it was a cup of water. And now all these adults at this party think it's funny to be doing shots of liquor with me getting me drunk. And Saturday morning, I woke up, yo, I was so sick. I threw up all day long. I thought I had the flu. <laughs> Wasn't the flu. About 7 in the evening, there's nothing left to come up, so I want to go get some fresh air. So I just neighborhood. And I walk by that same house. And they're having a bonfire party behind the house. And it's jumping. So I walk on down there. I sit down. I've learned how to light my own cigarette now. <laughs> this kid hands me a beer. And the kid sitting right next to me, he's got this funny looking cigarette like it's twisted up like he made it himself or something. And I was like, what kind of cigarette is that? And he's like, here kid, hit this. So now I'm smoking weed, nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana at age 11. So I was on pills by 12 years of age. I was addicted to pills at 13. On my 14th birthday, somebody put two light lines on a mirror and said, here, snort this, put a dollar bill up my nose. And I was shooting cocaine by 16 years of age. And 17, I found heroin. And I shot heroin for the next 18 months until someone showed me about meth two days before my 19th birthday. And I shot heroin and meth and cocaine for the next 10 years while I destroyed my life. And I ended up in prison. Now, I didn't want to go to prison. Uh, if you asked me in high school, if the superintendent of schools did a career day, if the counselor came in my classroom, if my coach said, hey, Michael, what do you have you thought about what you want to do when you get older? Well, let's see, I'd like to be a junkie and go to prison. No, that wasn't in the cards. That's not what was supposed to be my story. That's what happened because of the choices and the decisions that I made. Now, the nicotine, that was a big mistake. That alcohol, that weed, that was a big mistake. But the biggest mistake of my life was telling my parents everything was okay. Telling Miss Kogan I was good. Lying to Miss Campbell, lying to my coach. My principal tried to help me and I wouldn't let him. I used to lie to my parents about anything. All I had to do was ask for help. All I had to do was tell them what my uncles were doing. I remember one time Uncle Mike broke three metacarpals. He broke these three fingers right here and I was trying to hide it from all the teachers. Well, the teacher saw it and rushed me to the nurse. Well, the nurse gets me to the hospital. So I get to the hospital. Doctor says, how that happen? Uh, I fell off my bicycle. Oh, okay. My mom got called from the school, obviously, and she rushed to the hospital. She runs into the ER. Oh, my God, how did this happen? Doctor says, he fell off his bicycle. My mom's like, that's funny. He don't have a bicycle. I'm like, yeah, Ma, it was my friend's bicycle. You don't have any friends. If it wasn't true, I might have laughed like you. My mom said, you don't have any friends, and she was right. I don't have no friends. I beat them all up because I couldn't handle what I was going through. And all I had to do was ask for help. So I pushed everybody away. Mrs. Campbell, my coach, Mrs. Kogan, I pushed everybody away. I wouldn't let anybody help me. I had an aunt that was a police captain. If she knew what my uncles were doing, she probably would have shot them. She would have definitely got them arrested, but I didn't. I had a youth pastor that could have helped me. I had law enforcement heroes in my life. Man, I had a cousin. Kareem was, he graduated college and he started his own business in our town. And he used to stop by the house. Hey, little man, your mom says you ain't doing too good. Come on, let me help you. Let me take you for ice cream. Let me tell you, I'm fine, Kareem, I'm fine. Leave me alone, I'm good. I don't, I don't even want ice cream, I'm good. Man, I was a mess. And then I started doing drugs, man. It turned me into something that I wouldn't, I, I couldn't even dream of. And not only did I go to prison for 12 years, I got diagnosed with cancer twice. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, thank you, almighty God. But I got cancer, and I'm in a long-term study at Vanderbilt University right now. 12 years in remission. They proved drugs and paraphernalia caused my cancer. Hey, young people, vaping causes cancer. Causes cancer. And this stupid thing, this breeze, there's an ingredient in this device that causes cancer. Not that might cause cancer, not that possibly cause cancer. It's already been proven. Hey, gee, Mr. FDA, why don't you get that off the shelves? Yeah, they're not going to. So how do we stop this? Vaping causes cancer. Okay, your future is not college, ladies and gentlemen, and beyond. Your future is right here and right now. Because I don't care if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. 
the choices and the decisions that you're making right now are going to affect you the rest of your life. You don't see it. You don't see it. That's okay. Very few people do at your age, but now we're dealing with things that are poison, that are poison, like fentanyl, fentanyl and vapes. We have a problem. And see, you don't just affect you. You affect your family. Your family is affected. This stops at 2 o'clock or later? 2.10. So you affect your family. Not only did I affect my wife, my daughter, my son, I got really involved in drug addiction. Boy, it was bad. And I lost everything. I found success. I found success in my early 20s. I was running a multi-million dollar corporation. And I embezzled $9 million for drugs in 24 months and kind of put the whole company out of business. And I lost everything. We were living in Charlotte, North Carolina. And our house was getting foreclosed on. There was a sheriff's notice on the door. And my wife is like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? I got nothing left. I said, well, I think I have a drug problem. Oh, my God, yes, you were getting somewhere. You have a drug problem. Yeah, North Carolina is infested with drugs, babe. We're going to have to go somewhere where there's no drugs. What? We're going to have to move somewhere where there's no drugs. My wife's like, where is there no drugs? And I said, New Jersey. There's no drugs in New Jersey. So we go to New Jersey. Are there drugs in New Jersey? How long it took me to find them? One hour. I go to the convenience store to get some drinks and chips and sandwiches for my family. And I come out the convenience store door and there's a kid standing there. He's like, what's up? I was like, what's up? He's like, what you need? I said, what you got? Gone. All over again. It got so bad, I start hustling drugs, I start dealing drugs, running guns all up and down the East Coast. And I attracted the attention of a gang in Newark, New Jersey. And I get embraced into this set. And I start running guns and drugs for a gang. I open up my house to drug distribution. I got two kids on a coffee table cutting up drugs one day. And my five-year-old daughter, Kayla, walks into the living room. And she picks this kid's 9 millimeter Ruger off the coffee table. And they're letting her play with this loaded gun like it's a toy. And if the gun was cocked a half an inch more to the left, I wouldn't have a daughter right now. When she pulled the trigger, the bullet went through her cheek and her earlobe and smashed into the windows in the kitchen. And my wife kind of freaked out. And she begged me to take her to the hospital with my child. And I said, I have to go drop this load off, man. I have to. See, addiction will take you places you can't even imagine. My daughter shot in the mouth, and I don't even take her and my wife to the hospital. So when my wife comes back from the hospital, she loads her clothes up and the kids clothes up and she leaves me. She leaves me. So I'm a drug addict in full excruciating pain. I'm in the grips of my addiction. I don't know if you understand what a drug addict does when they're in pain. Anybody know? <laughs> More drugs. So the landlord puts an FU nut on the door, changes the locks, find a new place to live. And he put all my belongings in black garbage bags on the porch. So I load up him in load them up into my car, and I'm homeless living in my car for a couple of days. I got nowhere else to go. Well, about 45 minutes away is my mother. I have nowhere else to go, so I decided to call my mom because none of my gang friends would l let me stay on their sofa. Hey, Ma, can I come stay with you? <laughs> sure, son, come on home. I'm 28 years of age, and I moved back in with my mommy. Not a penny to my name, running guns and drugs in a gang as a full-blown IV heroin and meth addict. Move in with my What a success story. Well, I had to put a drug deal together because my addiction is out of control and I needed money. So I decided to put this big drug deal together and I brought two kids with me. They both got shot. And one of the kids that got shot actually died. He was big homie's little brother. I got his 18-year-old brother murdered in a drug deal that went bad, so he put a hit out on me. Bring him to me, I'm going to put a bullet in his head. So I take off on a drug binge for three days to lay low for a little while. <laughs> and when they came to the house, I wasn't home. But my mother was. And they murdered her. On Sunday, May 14th, 1995, I came home to find my 63-year-old mother strangled and murdered in her bedroom. Sunday, May 14th, 1995, happened to be Mother's Day morning. They murdered my mom on Mother's Day morning. 27 years later, if you think it gets any easier to talk about, I swear to you it doesn't. If you think the pain goes away, I'm the piece of garbage that got his mother murdered in a, on Mother's Day morning. I'm about four weeks away from Mother's Day. Imagine how the second Sunday of May is for me every year. See, when that kid gave me that cigarette, I didn't see any of you fall out of your chair. When that kid gave me that alcohol, I didn't see any of your jaws drop. 
When that kid gave me that joint, a lot of you were smiling, looking at the person next to you. He's going to smoke weed. He's going to smoke weed. Watch, watch, watch. See? See, it's not a big shock to you, right? An 11-year-old kid. An 11-year-old kid smoking weed and drinking alcohol and smoking a cigarette. Well, I didn't want to be in that cell. That wasn't supposed to be my story. The cell on the left, that's the first cell I was in for two years. That's the last cell I was in for five years. There was 22 cells in six prisons for 12 years. I can't get them back. I can't get them back. Well, no one thinks this is going to happen to them either. No one thinks this is going to happen to them. So I said it, and I'll say it again. It's the most important time of your life right now. This is the most important time of your life right now. And we got kids drying from fentanyl. That little 17-year-old girl thought she was taking a Xanax. That woman's 19-year-old son thought he was taking an Adderall. And then her 17-year-old son, daughter thought she was taking an Adderall. That little girl, Destiny Ayala, died in the girl's locker room of her high school because a friend gave her a pill. This kid was graduating as a junior from high school, going to Stanford University, and he wanted to do real good on that SAT. And his friend gave him an Adderall to study real hard, but it wasn't an Adderall. It was a fentanyl pill. That kid graduated salutatorian of his high school class in Prescott, Arizona last year. Full scholarship to Clemson for football. Jake had a full scholarship to Auburn for football. Neither of them made it because a uh, senior party two weeks after uh, high school graduation, somebody put pills in a bowl. And seven kids took pills out of that bowl and they were fentanyl. And it took paramedics 20 minutes to get to that lake house where they were having the party. And they were able to save five of the kids, seven kids died from fentanyl poisoning, and they were able to bring five of them back. We have a problem. Kids are dying. And kids were dying in 2010 from heroin all over this country, especially New Jersey. So I decided I was going to do a movie about it. I asked HBO if they would produce it. They said no. I went to A&E, History Channel, Discovery Channel, National Geographic. Nobody wanted to produce it, so I did it myself. There's this little city next to where I used to live in New Jersey called Camden. It's right next to Philadelphia. I don't know if you ever heard of it. I get out of my car and I start walking down the city streets of Camden, looking around for a heroin addict. It took me like 30 seconds. So I walked over to her. I said, how you doing? She goes, okay. I said, I'm making a documentary movie on addiction. Her name's Christina. She was living in this abandoned house right here. Uh, I said, I'd like to tell your story. She said, tell my story to who? I said, well, I go into schools and I talk to young people about drugs and alcohol. And she's like, you're going to show this to kids? I said, yes. So she pulls up her arm sleeves. She literally says, here, go show kids this. I don't know how old she looks to you in this picture. She's 21 years of age. Yeah. Three years earlier, that beautiful girl walked across her high school graduation stage to accept valedictorian of her high school class, top of her class, full scholarship to Temple University. So she becomes a cheerleader for the Temple Owls. She's on the top of a pyramid at a football game, and she falls. They missed her, and she hit the ground, and she fractured her tailbone. So they rush her to the hospital. And the ER doctor puts her on Vicodin, morphine liquid, and sends her on home. The doctor on Monday added Percocet. She's on three opioid medications and she gets addicted to them pretty quickly. And the doctors won't give her more. So she goes to see eight additional doctors. She was getting opioid pain pills from nine doctors. And when all the doctors found out about each other, they cut her off. So she walks 10 blocks down to a section of Philadelphia called Kensington and she picks up some heroin and that, ladies and gentlemen, took one month. When I interviewed her, she was shooting 30 bags of heroin a day. And three weeks after I interviewed her, she passed away. So did Brian, so did Molly, and so did Crystal. Those are the first four kids I interviewed on the first day, and they were all dead before the film came out. But I couldn't quit. I wanted to tell her story. So I kept going. And I went to Camden every single day for 10 months. I interviewed Caucasian kids. I interviewed African-American kids. I interviewed Hispanic kids, rich kids, poor kids, atheists and Christians and suburban kids and urban kids, every walk of life, 137 of them. What was crazy is 88% of the people that I interviewed, they all abused opioids. Wisdom teeth taken out. They took the sentence of home with 90 OxyContin. A, a volleyball game, one girl comes out on another girl's ankle. The one with the broken ankle goes home with Percocets. Uh, a lacrosse injury, a fractured wrist, a fractured ankle, 
goes home with our Oxycontin and Percocet. Opioids, we had a problem. And that's what I was supposed to make my movie about. Except in the process of filming this, I found out something different. Every one of the kids, 88% of my kids were on opioids before they ended up on heroin. But 100% of them had three things in common. Nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana. Now I've interviewed 10,700 people. 10,700 people for 22 networks and over 100 addiction projects and my own projects. And 100% of them. <laughs> alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana, 40 age 18. See, drug addiction is not about drugs. I know that sounds crazy. Drug addiction is not about drugs. Drug addiction is about that thing, <laughs> the brain. And so I want you to look at three things differently than you ever have before. Um, my addiction began at age 11. I'm 58 years of age. I have 47 years of personal experience. I ain't getting paid personally one penny to be here. I ain't a cop. I ain't a counselor. I ain't your parent. I'm not an educator. I'm here as someone who experienced this and now has dedicated his life to your generation, and your generation is under siege. I hope someone calls me in seven, 18 years, right? In 18 years, I hope someone calls me to tell me that my prediction that one-third of Generation Z was going to die by 45 years of age, I hope I'm wrong. I ain't going to get that phone call. Alcohol is a depressant. I'm not here to tell you don't drink alcohol because you're not one. I'm here to tell you don't drink alcohol because your brain's not developed. I'm not here to tell you don't vape, smoke cigarettes or chew tobacco because you're not 21. I'm here to tell you that if you vape, if you smoke cigarettes, if you chew tobacco, you're stimulating the development of your brain. And if you're a female, ovarian follicles are going to be destroyed by vaping, especially vaping weed. Young men, you're going to need some equipment too to get your beautiful wife pregnant when you start to have a family and it ain't going to work out. It's not even being discussed. And everyone wants to ignore the truth. I'm not telling you don't smoke weed because it's a legal drug. I mean, it's illegal for 20 and below. I'm talking about the development of your brain. I don't want you vaping, smoking weed because it changes and hallucinates the development of your brain. So I made a little video for you. They said if I got drunk, if I did coke, I'd be one of the guys. They said meth would help me get through my exams. They said sniffing glue was no big deal. Totally safe. I could party all night. They said heroin would be the best high I ever had. It would help me forget my problems. He said he'd love me forever if I smoked crack with him. They said I wouldn't get hooked after the first hit. They said that Ritalin would help me focus. They said weed wouldn't lead to harder drugs. They lied. He lied. Find out the truth. The truth about drugs. Drugfreeworld.org. Drugfreeworld.org. So the truth, the absolute truth about drugs is they're a lie. You know, they're a lie. And there's a lot of people lying to themselves. There's a lot of kids lying to themselves. I mean, I got five vapes in the middle school, and there wasn't a single middle school that told me those were the only five vapes in school. You know? And so I get it. I understand. Some people are going to lie to themselves. It's only two reasons why a kid wouldn't Turn in a vape. Only two. They think they're going to get in trouble. You ain't getting in trouble. Anyone comes up and gives me a vape, they don't know who gave it to me. You will not get in trouble. There is zero consequences. There's a box on that table out there. You could dump it in that box. There'll be a couple of them in the school. Vape and an anonymity. Just get rid of it. Put it in the box. The only other reason a kid wouldn't give me a vape is because you're addicted. You're addicted. You don't have to tell yourself the truth. But just like that kid, Michigan going to college on a football scholarship. Yo, if you have athletic ability, baseball, basketball, football, volleyball, softball, I promise you, you want to get bigger, stronger, and faster, it's going to be hindered. It, it, it slows blood flow. It constricts your veins and arteries. It also constricts muscle growth. No one's telling you the truth. The chemicals in vapes are going to destroy your generation, and people aren't paying attention. 90% of it begins as a teenager, which is why I came today. One of those teenagers that I couldn't get through to is Victoria Siegel. Man, I would, I would lay my life down if I could bring her back. 
but I can't. She died at 18 of a drug overdose. She did a Vogue sh model shoot that day for her birthday. She's a very famous young lady, very famous family. Seven brothers and sisters. Seven brothers and sisters. Her parents are multi-billionaires. David and Jackie Siegel are good friends of mine. He's the largest timeshare holder in the world. He's a multi-billionaire. And Jackie Siegel is the queen of Versailles. The queen of Versailles. So she was Mrs. Florida, Mrs. America, Mrs. World. Now she owns all three pageants. They just gave her a Broadway show a month ago. She's very, very famous and eccentric. And, um, you know, she's the queen of Versailles. They built the largest house in the country in Orlando, Florida. It was 90,000 square feet. Ask your teachers how big that is. A house, 90,000, that's a mall, okay? They built the largest house in the country, and I did a documentary about it. And Discovery Plus liked the documentary so much, they picked it up and turned it into a three seasons of a reality TV show. And right after season one aired, they lost their daughter to an overdose of drugs. Two weeks after the funeral, mom had the courage to walk into her bedroom. And she found her diary. <sighs> Man, it was horrendous. They called me up, please come to Orlando. They didn't even tell me why. I went down to read the diary. I had to read it 20 times before I could read it without crying. And uh, it was the roadmap of her demise. So I said to her parents, you're going to think I'm crazy. But I want to publish this into a book. I want to give this diary to every person every high school person in America, and every parent in America. It was so eerie, and at the end of her diary, she says if something happens to her, because she knew she was struggling with addiction, she says if something happens to me, I want my diary to be read by kids. <sighs> Talk about predictions. So we published it into a book, and it's on Amazon. It's 20 bucks, but I don't want you to have to spend your own money. So I went to her father, and I said, listen, I'm going to share this with high school students all across the country, but I ain't going to ask them to pay for it. I want you to pay for it. He said, I'll give you as many books as you can give away. So between August and December of last year, I gave away 1.4 million books to high school students. And that man wrote a $23 million check to pay for it. He asked me January 2nd, how many books are you going to give away this year? I said, 5 million. The lawyer leans over and says, Mr. Siegel, that's going to cost you about $65 million. And you know what he said? write the check. <laughs> he cares about you. He doesn't want what happened to that family to happen to you. Now, it was a teenage girl's diary, and I don't know if you all know this. Some of you do. Teenage girls, they're crazy. They're crazy in a good way. Teenage girls are crazy in a good way. She writes with a lot of flair, you know what I'm saying? There's 219 F-bombs in this diary. And I know you've never seen an F-bomb before in writing, right? Never. So, I have parent permission slips that I've sent to the school. Because if I'm going to give you a book with profanity in it, I think out of respect to you, out of respect to your parents, they should just, no. So go to your counselor today or anytime this week. I sent 120 books to this school. If I got to send 800 books to this school, I don't care. I will send you as many books as you want. I just ask you to make me one promise. If you're reading her struggles and it hits home, You've been through some stuff in your life, and she's going through it, and it really hits home. That's what your counselors are for. That's what your counselors, your social workers are for. That's why they're here. That's why the superintendent, that's why they spend all this money to put these people in your building. Don't make her mistake. Don't make my mistake. Please, if you're in the beginning of this journey, right, you don't need to, you don't need to destroy your chances of success. So let me tell you the biggest lie. The biggest lie you're being told, <laughs> it's by the tobacco industry. Well, that's been their strategy for 80 years right there. That's big tobacco strategy. And right in the middle of their strategy is target kids. And that's what they're doing to you. So in 1994, Congress held a hearing. And they bring the tobacco executives into Washington. And they sat them at a table in front of the Congressional Hearing Committee. And this one congressman asks them all a question. Listen to the question the congressman asks these tobacco executives, but listen to their seven answers. Yes or no, do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnston. Uh, congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. 
And I, too, believe that nicotine is... Yeah, so just tell me, were they lying? Were they lying? Now they're lying to you, except it's flavored mango now. Never in the history of our country has the federal government stood back and let an industry of poison go after the next generation. That's what they're doing. Obama administration did it. Trump's administration did it. Biden administration can't stop it because the courts are protecting the tobacco industry right now. Altria is the biggest vaping company in the whole world. They invented Juul. They invented synthetic nicotine. Nick Saltz, they own it. They're in 70% of the devices in our country. R.J. Reynolds, they have 53 brands. Mixed or Fog, Lost Mary, Elf Bar, Puff Bar, okay? And the marijuana vapes, Cannabis, Cake Bars, Runces. That's the two biggest vaping companies in the world, and they're owned by the two biggest tobacco companies in the world. China Tobacco is the largest tobacco company on the planet. British American is number two. China Tobacco owns Altria, and British American owns R.J. Reynolds. So in 2015, I was making a marijuana movie, and I took a part of Ape. It was an original mod, and they've changed a bit, right? But I've cracked 1,700 vapes to look at components. 1,700. Every vape that I have opened has three components. Some have more, but every vape has three components. If it's a liquid, there's a canister, a reservoir, okay? A cartridge, a jewel uh, for the juice. Or there's a pod, a cartridge for a pod. Or there's an insert like in a Mr. Fog inside or a Breeze or a Hide or a Kang Vape. Oh, my God, I got a whole selection here. On the inside, that's component number one. Component number two is a battery. Component number three is a heating element. It's called an atomizer. When you put a vape in your mouth and you inhale, you power the battery to heat the coils of the atomizer, and it sucks up the wax, the oil, the liquid to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 200 degrees Fahrenheit. When it exits the device, it's between 100 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. When it hits your lungs, when it hits the membrane of your lungs, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Fact. So is a cigarette. So is a cigarette. A butane lighter is 100 degrees Fahrenheit when it hits your respiratory system. Gee, that's why the insides of our lungs are deteriorating for lung cancer and emphysema. Well, when you get it in the lungs, it sends it out through your circulatory system. So they made these pens real sleek. So you can fit them in your pocket, put them in your bra. They flavored them. And there's over 7,000 vape flavors. There's over 7,000 vape. There's not 7,000 flavors of anything on earth. There's not 7,000 flavors of candy or ice cream. There's 7,000 flavors of vapes. That's not for the adults in this country. That's for you. So I don't care what they look like. They could be a Soren. They could be a one you wrap with a sleeve, disposable or not. They could have... Uh, thumb drive looking components, broadband looking components. The cartridge can go in the top like a Views or a Vibe or an Enjoy or a Ciro. Could be pods of Juul, pods of compatible companies, sticking them in Juuls. Could be a puff bar. I love how they put 5% on the casing of a puff bar. <laughs> 5%. It's between 12 and 15% nicotine in every single puff bar. How do they get away with putting 5? Because they're not regulated by the government. Mr. Foggs, I got one of them right there. That whole interior of that device is a metal sheath, just like the Elf Bar. The whole interior of that is a metal sheath. Breeze, there's a cancer-causing ingredient. The same ingredient that caused Zantac to be withdrawn from the whole world is in that device. And all these car cartridges and all these pods are all made in China. They're not all filled in China. 100% of them are made in China. We don't make pods in America. They make them in China, and China puts lead in every single metal they manufacture. So every single pod, every single cart, it's got that metal stem, it's got lead in it. And every time you hit it, you're putting molecular particles of lead in your system. And all these diseases that our grandmothers and our grandfathers get, now we're seeing it in our children. We're seeing it in teenagers and 20-year-olds. This is, here's the chemicals, last 100, here's my last, here's my last lab. That was two weeks ago. That's the top eight chemicals that were in middle school and high school vapes over the last three weeks. Formaldehyde, number one chemical. Diacetyl, diethylene glycol, propylene glycol, acrylamide, vitamin E acetate. Mm, do you know what that does to the body? And where's the regulation? So this is my friend Mark. Mark was 27 years of age when he died. 18 months before he died, he sat in the doctor's office holding his wife's hand. Their three little girls were in the waiting room playing with the toys. And the doctor says, Mark, if you don't quit vaping, 
you will die. Bronchiolitis obliterans. Well, he didn't quit vaping. And 18 months later, his wife buried him from acute respiratory distress syndrome. A lot of people like to call it popcorn lung. It ain't how the lung looks. It's because of ARDS diacetyl flavor. This is Daniel. Daniel got a double lung transplant at 17, 17 years of age. Do you know the average life expectancy of someone who gets a lung transplant? Seven to 10 years. He will not see his 30s. He's dealing with that right now emotionally, spiritually, mentally. So is his family. Thank God he didn't die. He had two new lungs. And he won't see his 30s. So he vaped one thing, Juul. He did use compatibles. No one really ever told him what that plastic base and that rubber top and that metal stem on the inside was going to do to his lungs or the chemicals that were in his pots. I was in Sydney, Australia doing schools when they were shipping $210 million of crystal meth in Sriracha hot sauce bottles. They were sending them into Los Angeles. Well, it wasn't, it was crystal meth in liquid form. And my friend said, wonder why they're putting crystal meth in liquid form. I said, because it's going in vape pens. Real quick, I'm done one minute. Six kids in West Virginia rush to the hospital, heroin in their vape pens. Four kids in Salt Lake City, Utah, rush to the hospital, crystal meth in their vape pens. This is a girl in Mifflin County, Pennsylvania. She died in her school library. She had fentanyl in her vape pen. Hold on, please. Girl in Alabama, I'm going to one minute. Girl in Alabama, 15 years of age, 15. She told her parents the week before she died she had fentanyl in her vape pens in school. Then she hits a vape pen. And New Rochelle, New York, I know it says student right there, but there wasn't one, there was two. That kid walks in with that pen, that cartridge in the pen, that cartridge in his pocket, and he takes a hit of the vape and hands it to the other kid, and they both go down on the floor. Just like your school, that school had Narcan, and the nurse brings them back from the dead. So this is 208 cases I have across the country of fentanyl and vape pens and pills. I'm sitting here begging you for a reason. I'm not asking you, I'm begging you. I have so much more information on my website, and I'm asking you to please go to it. You're going to get three booklets on drugs, and I'm asking you to look for them. And I want you to learn from them. If you want a copy of Victoria's Diary, go to your counselor. I will get you a copy of that book free of charge. Okay? And there's a banner out there. You don't have time to sign it today? Fine. But it's going to be in your school tomorrow. And I'm asking everyone in this room to sign that banner and make a pledge to live your life drug-free. If anyone in this room's got a vape, you want to give it up, give it to me. I will so, I'll be so grateful. Please don't let me leave this school with five vapes. Please give it up to me. If it's not here, it's at home, get rid of it. You will not get in trouble. Thank you so much for letting me share with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.